one of the last, not the, not the last thing that Ashley Hutchins did before he left Fairport Convention, but one of the things that he did when I was working with him with Fairport, <coughs> which resonates down the years, uh, Fairport Convention were playing a 24-hour marathon charity concert at the Roundhouse in London, <coughs> protesting against the Vietnam War. And they got, I think, a rather civilized um, set time, about 9 o'clock in the evening. And they played their set, and then Ash then everybody went home. They went home to, you know, went off to have a curry or something. And Ashley Hutchins decided to stay around and listen to the other artists. And, and they put the unknown ones on at, you know, mid in the graveyard shift, you know, 2, 3, 4 in the morning. And at some point in the middle of the night, this guy got on stage with the guitar and sang a few songs. And Ashley was impressed and went up and got his name and telephone number. And he came into the office the next day and he handed me this piece of paper. And he said, I think you should call this guy. And that, of course, was Nick Drake. And um, at this point, I usually, you know, read some stuff about Nick and tell, talk about the process of recording and everything. But I know it's a little redundant because you all obviously have your tickets for the Opera House on Friday night. And if those of you who don't are going to go home as soon as you get home and go on the line and buy them. So I don't want to waste, you know. But um, uh, no, no, I know. I'm just kidding. I'm just but um, uh the <coughs> the process i mean it's it's i'm just going to jump ahead a little bit in terms of i mean you you know the story of how few records nick sold in his lifetime and how um uh it was about 2 years after nick died that i started to get people knocking on my door in london and just saying are you the guy that knew nick drake and um, and you could tell, you know, something was stirring. And then during the 80s, every year, records started to sell more and more and more. And um, and uh, two and a half years ago, Birmingham Town Hall asked uh, me to pull together a concert because Nick had lived, he grew up not so far from Birmingham. And they were doing a weekend series about British originals or some concept like that. So we did this concert, and somehow, uh, I mean, I've been involved with some tributes to Nick before, um, and they were good, but something about this one in Birmingham was just kind of magical, and um, the band, we had Danny Thompson on bass, and, um, and this guy, Neil McCall, is the son of um, Ewan McCall, um, who has learned all of Nick's tunings and parts and how to do this, and he's just wonderful as a musician and guitar player. And Kate St. John, who's the musical director who I've worked with in a number of other projects, she, she and I brought in Robert Kirby, who was Nick's arranger, and he conducted strings. And we settled on this kind of formula, you know, a kind of, t I know it sounds, doesn't sound good, the formula, but it is, it's very good. It's a strict, rigid formula, and it's wonderful. Eight singers, four male, four female, two songs each, and then duets and collaborations. And we, the personnel changes and the songs change, but it always seems to work beautifully. And um, so um, for any of you who are still in doubt, um, we have um, Robin, of course, is uh, going to sing uh, some different Nick Drake songs on Friday than the one he's going to sing in a minute. Uh, Scott Matthews. And Green Gartside from Skitty Politi are the three men from Britain. And uh, Vashti Bunyan, who, you know, it's the sort of, if you get depressed about Nick's story, you can then think about Vashti's story and get really happy. Because her records, her record that I did with her in the 60s didn't sell either. But in fact, it sold so few copies that the that they became incredibly valuable. And when one of them was sold at a vinyl auction for 750 pounds or something, and some magazine did a story about who the hell is Vashti Bunyan and why would somebody pay 750 pounds 
and one thing led to another and offers started coming into her to re-release the record and make a new record and I think she's been out here and toured here and uh, so she's she's uh, singing tom on Friday night and um, as is um, Lisa Hannigan who has been here many years before with Damien Rice when she was with him and uh, Crystal Warren and there's a footnote to that because um, when I first heard Nick's first demo tape, there was a song on that called Time Has Told Me. And immediately I thought to myself, I've got to send that to Roberta Flack. That could be her six follow-up to the first time ever I saw your face. And uh, she never recorded it. <laughs> <laughs> but in fact, it worked out perfectly because now Crystal sings that song and just kills whatever Roberta Flack would have done with it. And... Um, um, and then, of course, th when we tra we've traveled once, we've taken the show outside of Britain before once to Italy, and we thought, hey, okay, here's what we'll do. Save a little money, but also have a kind of connection to the local, uh, the local scene by having um, one male singer and one female singer from Italy. And that worked great initially. And so we thought, hey, we'll do the same in Australia. And it can be a little nerve-wracking because it's a bit like a mail-order bride, you know. You, you kind of, you, you make this date, you know. And today we had our first rehearsal, and I have to say that um, Luluk and Shane Nicholson were just fantastic in the rehearsal today, so we're absolutely delighted. And um, so that's sort of the lineup that we're, you're going to hear on Friday night. And... Um, Maybe I'll just read a little short thing about the song, one of the songs that Luluk is going to sing. Um, um, well, it's uh, it's in fact, the two songs that the Australian singers are going to sing, there's a little short passage here. I was, um, the day we recorded the track for Poor Boy, I had spent the morning mixing a record by South African jazz pianist Chris McGregor. When Nick and the other musicians arrived, Chris asked whether he could stick around to listen. McGregor had grown up in the trans sky bush, smoking daga with the Kosa, Kosa boys from the village. That day, he sat in the back of the control room in his dashiki and pillbox cap, stuffed his pipe full of grass, and listened. After the morning mix, my ears were full of Chris's piano. When Nick, Dave, Peg, and Mike Kowalski started running through the song, I turned and saw Chris grinning. I asked whether he, what he was thinking, well, if he was thinking what I was thinking. While John Wood went to get the microphones, I buzzed down to the musicians in the studio. You're getting a pianist in a minute. Then introduced Nick to Chris. He had a look at the chord sheet Nick wrote out, and turn we turned on the tape. That first take piano solo on Poor Boy was one of my favorite moments in the studio. And um, uh, and Shane Nicholson's going to sing Poor Boy as well. I had been stunned by John Cale's arrangements on Nico's The Marble Index and shocked that Electra failed to pick up its option for the second LP. I convinced Warner Brothers to finance a sequel, and after a week of recording in New, or New York, John Cale flew to London to help me finish off Desert Shore. After a session one day, Cale put his feet up on the mixing desk, waved his arm imperially at John Wood, and said, let's hear what else you guys are working on. We played him a few things and eventually got to Nick. Cale was amazed. Who the fuck is this guy? I have to meet him. Where is he? I mean, where is he right now? I rang Nick and told him that John Cale would be over in half an hour. Nick said, oh, uh, oh, okay. I wrote out Nick's address. John grabbed it and ran down the stairs. The next morning, I had a call from Cale. We're going to need a pickup for the viola, an amp, a Fender bass, a bass amp, a Celeste, and a Hammond B3 organ this afternoon. <laughs> I had scheduled a mix on another project that day, but Cale had decided it was time to record Northern Sky and Fly. They arrived together, John with a wild look in his eyes, and Nick trailing behind. 
Despite his domineering manner, Kale was very solicitous towards Nick, who seemed to be guardedly enjoying himself. His only choice was to relax and be carried along. And uh, Lulik is going to do Fly tomorrow. It's a beautiful version. On Friday. Beautiful version. And now we're going to hear... <laughs> sound of tuning up because <laughs> back in the 60s there were no chords you were just tuning to yourself or each other because under socialism the strings tune to each other under capitalism every string is perfectly in tune with itself look what happened <laughs> not subscribing to a higher power I think you need some intervention 